close friends go their own way, Paul wrecks pagan wisdom in Athens, and we see the deadly nature of long-winded pastors. Welcome to Daily Gospel, equipping you to know God through His Word and His Son, Jesus Christ. My name is Keith, and this is Brandon, and we are pastors here in Santa Cruz, California at Gospel Community Church. Welcome, like, subscribe, comment, all the good stuff that the gospel goes out. Brandon, it's going to be a good day in the Book of Acts. It's going to be a good day. I mean, it's a beautiful day. Look at this weather out here. Yes. We're in Santa Cruz, so it's always nice. I know. A couple days ago, it was like kind of cold. You know, so I was like, oh. Yeah, it was like... In the, in the 40s or 30s or something. Oh, man, that's rough. Yeah, it's rough for Santa Cruz. We have, for those of you, hopefully, I mean, maybe by God's grace, someone's listening in the Midwest or something, we have at least two weeks in the year that's like below 50 degrees. Yeah, I know, it's rough. It's, it's really rough. rough over here, yeah. So, But we're surviving. No, yep, we're surviving. Yep, surviving and thriving. To be fair, we have to pay a lot for real estate and housing. Yeah, you so. got to be a multimillionaire to own a shack here. So. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. anyway. So, it's a little rough, but... Um, we are in the book of Acts, and man, it's a it's a good one. As we've as we've seen, we're in this section of the book, the second half, so to speak, mm-hmm. where we're focused on the Apostle Paul and his ministry. Yep. So Peter was sort of in the center stage in the first twelve chapters, and now it's Paul, mm-hmm. and um, he's. We've just seen his first missionary journey. Yep. And we're going to pick up today in chapter fifteen with the Jerusalem Council. We'll look at Paul's second and third missionary journeys. That'll mm-hmm. all be today. Yeah. So we'll cover a lot of ground. The Jerusalem Council is the center theologically and Mm -hmm. kind of, I don't know, I haven't done the math on this, but kind of location-wise of the book of Acts. It really is at the very center. Um, And so, and if that's for a reason, right? I mean, it takes, uh, it's dealing with the question of Gentile inclusion in the church. Right. So Peter has seen Gentiles come to faith in Jesus. That's exciting. They've they've had the Holy Spirit given to them. Mm -hmm. So there's this amazing movement um, toward the Gentiles, but the question is posed in in verse one. So, chapter fifteen, verse one: Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Hmm. So, this is what becomes known as the circumcision party in the New Testament. Yeah, which again, it's not a theme for your birthday party. Okay. <laughs> Um, I know Laura's for for my daughter. She's gonna do pirates and mermaid theme. Ah. So yeah, this is not that kind of a theme. It's a group of people with an emphasis on circumcision in order to be part of the people of God, right? Yeah. Or to be part of the church. So they're trying to take Old Testament law and say you still have to follow that or parts mm-hmm. of it to be a believer in Jesus, right? Or a different way of thinking of it, you have to become ethnically Jewish, right, to be a Christian, right. So this is a big question, right. right? Where do we stand on that? What does it mean for Gentiles to come into the church? Is there anything that you have to do in addition to believe in Jesus mm-hmm. to be truly saved? Wow, that's a massive question for the church, right? Yeah, it's one that the, the Catholics are still getting wrong. Yeah, you know, not to <laughs> yeah. not to <laughs> pick on them, but um, so they go. So they go to Jerusalem for a council. So you have the main leaders of the church gathered together in Jerusalem, and James. The brother of Jesus is sort of the, the the main guy who seems to be kind of directing it. But it's really the whole church gathered together, and we see in verse nine, um, the speaking, bearing witness to what happened. Peter is bearing witness to what happened with the Gentiles, um, and he says that God, the Holy Spirit, made no distinction between us and them, mm. having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Yeah. So why are we adding back in the law when we were never able to fulfill the law to begin with? Right, exactly. That was the whole last chapter, or chapter 13. Exactly. Yeah. But, verse 11, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Right. So again, he's using that just as language. We are on the same level as them. We're saved in the same way. There's no distinction now between Jew and Gentile. Mm-hmm. And so we see that they, there's a recognition from the council that the inclusion of the Gentiles is part of the plan of God, mm-hmm. right? Verses 15 and following, where he quotes uh, about the, the remnant of mankind, the Gentiles who are called by, by God's <coughs> name. So there's an ingathering of the Gentiles. Um, this, is, this is an important part of God's plan. Mm-hmm. So we shouldn't be making Gentiles follow the law. 
So the whole idea here, just in the broad terms, is Jesus plus plus nothing right. equals salvation. Right. So it's the grace of God given through Jesus that brings us salvation. We add nothing to that. Right. And in fact, to think that we can, or that we can add some barrier to someone else coming into the church, is is very concerning. Right. right? It's a it's a huge deal. So Paul will deal with this issue at length in the book of Galatians. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Galatians was probably written before the Jerusalem Council. And it speaks to these issues that mm-hmm. Paul is, is fighting for. So they do, it's interesting, they do in verses 19 and 20, they mention a few guidelines. The one that kind of stands out is that you have to abstain from blood. So there's some that are just, you know, they're saying essentially, hey, let's put no stumbling block, but don't be sexually immoral, don't do this thing, and don't and abstain from blood. Yeah, so don't get blood transfusions, right? No, don't drink blood soup. Oh. What, 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 where is that? Do they have blood soup? <sighs> it sounds really Somewhere gross Asian. and thick. Yeah, yeah. Disgusting. But um, that, is a, that is a thing, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, this is something that's like, okay, well, uh, don't drink blood. Cool. Check. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I'm not a crazy person. But the inclusion here is kind of strange, but it harks back to the Noahic Covenant. Okay. Genesis 9.4. So the idea here, I believe, is he's saying that there are certain guidelines given to all of humanity. Mm-hmm. Remember, the Noahic covenant is given to all of humanity, not just mm-hmm. to the Gentile or not just the Jews. Um, so this is not Mosaic law. This is a standard before that. Mm-hmm. But um, but the, this is you know a statement essentially. The big takeaway from this is Jesus saves Jew and Gentile in the same way, mm-hmm. and there's no need to come into a different ethnicity to be saved by by Jesus. Right. God's people is no longer to, confined to one ethnicity or one group of people, but it's going to go out through the entire world. Mm-hmm. So this is this is a big, big shift in the history of redemption. Now we see in verse 22 that it's the whole church gathered for this this council. Mm-hmm. Some people would think it's, you know, maybe it's just the apostles, representatives of the church, but l- listen to what it says here. It says, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders. So those are the leaders. Right with the whole church hmm. to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch. So this is a gathering of the entire church to make this decision. Of course, there are certain prominent leaders in that. Right. This isn't just pure democracy where it's just total chaos. There are guys who clearly are speaking with authority that everyone else is listening to, but this is an affirmation made by the entire church. Yeah. And for us, we believe you know we're congregationalists, so we believe the congregation, the members, have a voice in certain key Decision right. making in the church, yeah, and but we're still elder led, right? Yes, so. yeah. Elders lead. There's still leadership in the church, but there's a times when the whole church needs to speak in on different issues. Of course, yeah. So, um, so this is this is interesting, and you know, maybe some people will say, "Well, this would be you know, thou- we had three thousand come to Jesus in Acts two, and then five thousand. So this is like what ten, twenty thousand people. Well, th- Saul did a good job when he was Saul." <laughs> Paul and who saw of driving people out of the area. Yeah. So it's probably not the same huge number of people. Right. But either way, you can have a meeting with a lot of people and still have it, you know, be effective if there's good leadership. Yeah. So they sent out a letter about this, outlined that decision. So they spread that around. And uh, Paul and Barnabas are going to, oh, Paul's going to go on his second missionary journey. Before he does, mm-hmm. Paul and Barnabas split up. So Mark, John Mark, as we talked about in the Gospel of Mark, is the Yoko Ono of the the Beatles, which are Mar- uh, Paul and Barnabas, <laughs> and they have a disagreement about whether Mark is fit to be in the ministry. Right. And so Paul says, no, Barnabas being that son of encouragement, he's like, Paul, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for me. <laughs> Come on, Mark's going to be great. He's going to write the second Gospel. He's going to be so legendary. We need to bring him in. And Paul's <laughs> like, no, I got business to do. I'm not going to bring this guy who abandoned us before. So this is providential, right? Because they're able to split apart and to do more ministry. Mm -hmm. Paul takes on Silas and he'll meet Timothy as well. But so Paul is doing ministry in one area, Barnabas another, and God's God's word is still going out and expanding. Yeah, church has grown. So chapter 16 begins the second missionary journey of Paul. They meet Timothy, who you may recognize from such great hits as First and Second Timothy, right? So he's he later comes in the Bible as letters are written by Paul to him. What a legend. He's sort of an apostolic um, delegate. He works with Paul to help plant churches. Um, verse three, it says Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Poor, poor Timothy. So <laughs> this is so confusing. So. 
<laughs> we just decided the last it chapter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, we just decided that, hey, no, you don't follow the law. You're not justified by your works. There's no part of it, and you don't need to become a Jew to become a Christian. Yeah. Great. Check. In fact, Paul had fought on this point earlier. So we'll see in Galatians in chapter 2, verse 3, that Titus was with him earlier, and he refused to circumcise Titus yeah. because there were some people who said, you're not a true Christian until you're circumcised. Mm-hmm. So why is it now that the decision has been made that he's circumcising Timothy? Well, this becomes the weaker brother principle, right? So when it was an issue of the gospel, you know, do you have to do certain works to be saved? Paul was saying, no, I'm not going to circumcise Titus. We have to fight for this truth. Mm -hmm. And once that point was conceded and decided, he says, well, if it helps the ministry and it doesn't offend, you know, we cannot offend people, then let's have Timothy circumcised. I guess it wasn't him being circumcised, so no skin (laughs) off his, well, I shouldn't (laughs) shouldn't say that. Um, But anyway, so yeah, so that seems to be what's happening here is he's trying not to offend and to do good ministry. And so he decides, yeah, don't hinder the gospel. Yeah, why not? It's not a big deal. It's, It's just, it's just a symbol. Uh, we'll go ahead and do that so that we can minister more effectively. Yeah. So a dream is sent to Paul that where someone called him to Macedonia. So he heads out to Macedonia to a town called Philippi, which we know from the book of Philippians later, right? So that's he writes that book to the Philippians who are this church, and he converts Lydia, who becomes an influential part of his ministry. He converts the Philippian jailer. So Paul, what happens is Paul and Silas, they... Um, they heal a girl with a demon, and that it lands them in prison because that girl was making money with her, you know, divination and stuff. So they're thrown into prison, and while they're there, God sends this earthquake. So at look at chapter sixteen, verse twenty-five. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So I just love this man. Just the spirit. They're like singing, they're praying, and all the, all the prisoners are listening to them. They can't fall asleep because Paul and Silas are singing. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but yeah. So they're they're listening, and then verse twenty six. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, mm. and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Right. So God does a miracle, lets everyone go, and the Philippian jailer. This is just jailer in, in Philippi. He s- decides he's going to kill himself because he sees the doors are open. He assumes all the prisoners have left. Mm-hmm. And before he does, Paul stops him and says, no, we're here. <laughs> and and that prompts a response from the jailer of what must right. I do to be saved? And, uh, and, and Paul says in verse 31, Acts 16, 31, very famous. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Mm. So salvation again is mentioned here and believing in Jesus. So very simple, great memory verse. Memorize yeah. that one as a kid, like a great one just to say, that's how we proclaim the gospel, believe in Jesus and be saved. And so he he you know brings them into his home. He um, repents of his sin. He believes in Jesus. And the he you know he ends up talking with Paul and saying, Okay, you can you can go free, you know, you've been set free. And Paul says, No, I'm not gonna I'm a Roman citizen. They beat us publicly. I'm not going to just go away. So he makes them come and apologize to him. (laughs) Makes this big thing of it, which I love so much. And so, and then they say in verse 39, um, so the the rulers came and apologized to them. They took them out and asked them to leave the city. (laughs) And they go to Lydia's house, which is in Philippi. So, (laughs) nope, not going to do that. Um, Chapter 17, we see the Bereans appear on the scene. The, the Bereans, which are more noble because they search the scriptures, right? Uh, Acts 17, 11. They, they receive the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Mm. So they set an example for us. Yep. Of it, It's fascinating because Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He is speaking and, and he's writing the very words of God. Mm-hmm. And they are still taking time to go and to check and to make sure what he's saying is true from the Old Testament. Right. And the Bible praises them for that. Yeah. The Bible praises them for not just receiving blindly what they're being told, even right. from someone like Paul. Right. So how much more true is that in the church today yeah. when you hear a sermon to spend time like a Berean going to Scripture, checking and confirming what is said, right. and not just passively hearing and receiving. Right. And in that way, we do our part as each one of us is part of the church to guard doctrine, right? To make sure that we stand on truth 
and that we don't allow ourselves to be pushed along with the the trends of culture. Yeah. So the Bereans are an awesome example. And then we see Paul um, preaching the gospel on Mars Hill. This mm-hmm. is one of the, the key events in this section of the book of Acts. Um, you can go, so Mars Hill, you can go there today. There's a big plaque that has the entire sermon of, of Paul on it. Uh, and if you go there today, essentially what you'll do, it, this is what I did when I was there, is you go to the... Uh, the um, Areopagus? Not the Areopagus. The, the Mars Hill is the Areopagus. Yeah. You go to the, the big old hill with the temple up there. What's it called? The Parthenon. Yeah. You go to the Parthenon, which is on this... In Athens, there's it's like flat, mm-hmm. and then they just have these like mountains that stick out. It's the mm-hmm. weirdest topography. Mm-hmm. Just these huge like rocks <laughs> that are like, I don't know, 200 feet high. So you climb up to the to the uh, Parthenon, and you can see all this pagan temple and all this you know beauty, and it, it's just really a sight to see. And as you're up there, you look around and you can see all these old temples. Hmm. All around you, down below, are different temples and the agora and places like that. So as you go down from the Parthenon, you you are you know surrounded by all these pagan temples. And at the foot of the Parthenon is Mars Hill and. Paul is there, and this was sort of a, a little hill that was a place where philosophers would come and debate things, right? So a public forum, someone could get up there and and share, you know, their viewpoint on something. So so Paul gets up there and begins to proclaim this, mm-hmm. and um, he preaches a sermon that endures beyond all the pagan temples of that time. Yeah, it's awesome, pretty, pretty amazing. And so we see this. He he uses as his entry point very famously in verse twenty two, this. Uh, this altar to the unknown God. So he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in everywhere you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Mm. <laughs> I love it. All right, so you guys missed it. I'm going to tell you. So he has a, has a great intro. And then he he speaks to their own culture, mm. right? He quotes from their own um their own philosophers and poets yep. in verse 28. But so he's he's showing them their own viewpoint and essentially he's going to say that their own viewpoint is inconsistent. Mm-hmm. So this is what you believe, but you don't live in accordance with that because you know that God can't be confined to temples. That's pretty obvious if they're divine, they can't be confined to these human spaces. This is the, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hands. He's not served by human hands. Mm -hmm. God can't be confined in this way. And in fact, idolatry itself is foolish. It's foolish. Verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. How can you capture who God is in these images? You've lowered God to something less than even us. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make any sense. And so he confronts them with the truth in verse 31, that there's a day of judgment coming and that, that God has given us a sign that judgment is coming by raising a man from the dead. Right. Now here is where he's really confronting their worldview because they would think that this is foolish. Right. This is this is ridiculous. I mean, the Greek philosophy typically was going beyond. Right? I mean, as, as Plato and Aristotle, as these forms behind reality, so you want to transcend the physical. Right. But why, so why would God raise someone from the dead? Right. So they begin to mock this. Yeah, some people mocked, but some people believed, right? And some people believed. Yeah, yeah and some people believed. So he's, he's boldly giving this testament to, to who God is, and God brings some to faith. Yeah. So that's that an amazing story in, cha- in chapter 17, and great passage to just meditate on. Mm-hmm. Chapter 18, we see him arrive in Corinth, um, and uh, we see more of it, this movement toward the Gentiles in verse 6. Right, he says, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So again, there's an increasing movement mm-hmm. towards ministry to Gentiles right. in Paul's ministry. And, um, and God gives him this, this dream that he's going to be, um, that he, a vision in the night, so a dream that he's going to be kept safe. Mm-hmm. God has people in Corinth. He's going to keep him safe. So Corinth, of course, familiar from First and Second Corinthians. Mm-hmm. So they, he'll, he'll write to them as well later. All right, so chapter 19 is the third and final missionary journey of Paul. And um, and we see some of the same themes again. So we see this, chapter 19, verse 20, the word of God continued to increase and prevail mightily. So this word, the word of God is doing its work. It's progressing. It's moving. 
even as the authorities try to stop the apostles, the word of God still yep. increases. Good and we God. see we see that in the third world today, right? In oh, yeah. the global south where mm-hmm. God's word is spreading in a crazy way in spite of the obstacles. There's also that same movement toward Rome in verse 21. Paul resolved through the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So Paul is really fixed on his mission. And we'll see that just relentless pursuit of this mission to to go to the center of the the civilized world rome to proclaim the gospel to see people come to faith right. and really it's from there that, that the, the gospel will go out mm. in the coming generations so uh, a group of craftsmen led by this man named demetrius who's a silversmith start a riot against paul they're in ephesus and he's ruining their idol business so they're making idols and paul is saying the idols aren't god Mm. And that's upsetting to them. And <laughs> Artemis is their like patron saint god, whatever. <laughs> and uh, and so they're fighting for Artemis, and they're upset because their business is ruined. So they start a riot, essentially uh, opposing Paul. And I love even the the uh, <laughs> someone's trying to quiet them down, right? Alexander, who's a leader. And it says, verse 34, but when they recognized that he was a Jew for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours. So just going, shouting. Eventually the riot is silenced and that their wrath is turned away from Paul. But we can see that Paul is not loved any more than Jesus is. Again, that same theme of, um, and and Paul's going to go through trials just like Jesus went through. Right. There's going to be a lot of parallels there. Chapter 20, we see a classic preacher move where Paul is is preaching and he's preaching way into the night (laughs) uh, until midnight. That's what it says in verse 7. That's crazy. Yep. Long preaching. That is crazy. When did he start, I wonder? Oh. I would hope it was at night. Probably the third hour. I hope it wasn't morning. (laughs) Uh, But he's preaching and it says, uh, so they're in this upper room and he's preaching there. And in verse 9, a young man named Eutychus sitting in the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Mm -hmm. So Paul literally preaches someone to death. (laughs) He puts this guy to sleep and he falls out of the window. Uh, Wow, that's that's rough. But Paul shows the power of God through this by... You know, going down there and being like, "Yeah, he's fine," and, and going and eating a meal, and then, <laughs> and then he Eutychus continues to converse. That's yeah. the best part. He's like, "Guy dies," and then he goes back to conversing. So <laughs> like, yeah, I'm gonna get some food. And, um, <laughs> he talks all night still. Yeah, <laughs> until daybreak. Saying. That's great. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then there's this at the end of 20, and we'll finish on this. There's this speech to the Ephesian elders. Mm-hmm. Amazing passage for those in ministry, or those aspiring to be in ministry, as it speaks to. You know Paul's last encounter with these elders in this place he's been in for years. And he tells them he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested. He's not going to see their faces again. And he says, I just want to finish my course, right? I want to testify to the, the grace of Jesus. And um, he says, he begins to speak to his own ministry in verse 26. He says, I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Yep. So this should mark our ministry, right? That we proclaim everything that God says. We don't hold back the truth or the commands of Scripture. Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of leaders, sadly, do that. Mm-hmm. They 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 truncate the Word of God. But Paul wouldn't, and he warns them about wolves that are going to come in and destroy the flock of God, and how it's the job of the elders to guard against that. So this is very instructive for us. Um, and so he and then he speaks to his own. Uh, purity and how he dealt with the people. Mm-hmm. He didn't covet. Um, he he worked hard. He was he was worth his his keep, and how he modeled for them the very words of Jesus in verse thirty five. He says, um, "I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak." And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, "It is more blessed to give than to receive." Mm. What's interesting is this is not quoted in the Gospels. So this is something that Paul has heard from the apostles, uh, right. presumably, that he's now sharing. I, I think it might be, I'm trying to think if there's any other place in Scripture where Jesus' words are quoted outside of hmm. the, the Gospels that are not quoted in the Gospels. Yeah. But and it might be the only one. I don't know. But um, but yeah, so so he's sharing with what his ministry is all about, how he's given sacrificially to serve them and to give them the Word of God. 
in its yeah. fullness. Amen. Yeah, what a reminder to pastors, what a reminder to people, you know, even sitting in churches every week to expect that of your leaders, to preach the yeah. whole counsel of God, to sacrifice for the church, and for you guys to do, you know, in part the same thing. That's right. Cool. Well, that's all we got time for this week. Thanks for joining us for Daily Gospel, and we'll see you next week for the last part of the Book of Acts.